Good morning. Uh, I can see we have lots of people here already. I can see the chat is going well. Uh, and welcome to this uh, UK Moth Recorders meeting. Um, it's, uh, it's sad that we can't uh, all be in Birmingham as usual. I've missed my annual January pilgrimage to uh, Birmingham and the bracing walk to the uh, conference venue first thing in the morning. I've uh, not yet had the regulation six coffees before uh, starting uh, to chair the meeting. But uh, anyway, it's uh, nevertheless great to see you all. And hopefully there are some people attending this morning's virtual meeting who, uh, who would not normally um, ever be able to attend our person-to-person uh, our -person gathering in, uh, in Birmingham. A uh, couple of quick points of housekeeping. Uh, I'm not going to point out the toilets or talk to you about fire alarms. That's, uh, you know, you'll have to deal with that sort of stuff yourself. Um, but um, those of you who are relatively new to Zoom, down at the bottom of your screen, if you hover the mouse over, you'll find a range of different options. Um, many of you already found the chat option. So the chat option is for talking to each other. At the moment, um, it seems to be preset to only sending chat messages to the panelists. When you, when you start typing your message, you see there's a little two space above there um, and it's set to all panelists. Um, you need to change that using the little drop down arrow to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise it's only those of us that are speaking this morning that are seeing your chat. Not that that's not lovely. You know, we like to talk to you as much as anyone else, but uh, uh, I'm guessing you probably want to uh, want to talk to the whole uh, the whole meeting. Um, so uh, use the chat to chat uh, amongst yourselves. Lots of people telling us what the weather's like, where people are, uh, are dialing in from, which is great. Um, when we come on to the main speakers, and assuming that there is time left after uh, each individual talk for questions then we're happy to take questions from the audience. Um, but in order to put a question to a speaker, you need to type it in the Q&A box. So not in the chat. Um, we will be, people will be looking at the chat and may be able to answer questions, more general questions that you might have in the chat. But if you, are, if you want to ask a specific question uh, to a speaker about something they've said during their talk, use the Q&A button um, and uh, we will try to read out as many questions as we have time for uh, to the speaker on screen at the end of their talk. Time, time uh, permitting, of course. So um, I will move straight on then and um, I'm delighted to um, start be starting this morning's uh, UK Moth Recorders meeting. Uh, with a welcome address from our Chief Executive, Julie Williams. Julie, over to you. Thanks, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a bit dull and grey here in Dorset too, I can tell you. Um, and as Richard said, welcome to the BC's annual Moth Recorders meeting. I am very sad that we're not all meeting face-to-face -face in Birmingham this morning. But I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us today via Zoom. At the last count when I had a look, it was at nearly 250 people, I think. A warm welcome to very old friends who, who I personally know well, and also the new ones who can't normally attend this event, but are actually able to join us virtually today. It's definitely one benefit of the new world that we're finding ourselves in, the ability to engage with many more people around the UK and beyond. We can't get away today, I don't think, from mentioning the dreaded word COVID. And as you know, it has had serious consequences for all of us, both professionally and personally. BC as an organisation has not been immune from the loss of income, loss of valued staff and an inevitable slowing down of our work with a series of lockdowns and restrictions hindering our ability to get out in the field. One major effect of the changes in 2020 was the sad departure of Mark Parsons. Now, Mark decided to say farewell to us over the summer, although he has not disappeared completely and he will still be working with, some, with BC on some very exciting projects over the next few years. 
Mark, for those of you who don't know him well, joined BC in 1999 when BC made a conscious decision to do more conservation work. Over 20 years, he worked tirelessly to raise the profile and increase our work on moths, developing and delivering extensive conservation programmes, including managing BC's moth conservation work under the Natural England Species Recovery Programme. His achievements are many. In 2006, his technical expertise and support helped us develop the Moths Count Project, the largest single heritage lottery project on biological recording awarded at the time. An absolutely phenomenal project and achievement. The resulting National Moth Recording Scheme is now, as many of you know today, is one of the largest of its type in the world. Its accumulation, the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's Larger Moths, which along with his other books, reports and papers, are a lasting testament to his massive contribution to moths, their conservation and to butterfly conservation. And I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Mark for his significant contribution to BC's work on moths over two decades. The world is facing a climate and ecological crisis and never has monitoring biodiversity been more important to inform our conservation management, measure progress and influence at all levels. We need sound data from committed and skilled volunteers to address crucial questions about environmental change, biodiversity loss and its implications for all nature, including our own well-being. So BC's work starts with you, the recorders. Your data, your hard work allows BC to position itself in a fairly unique position. Everything we do is evidence-based and solution-focused. Your recording effort is the absolute base for all of our work as an organisation. Using your biological records, we have been able to carry out vital research work like the scientific review by George Tordoff and Callum McGregor on how is light pollution affecting our moths and butterflies, and the fact checker report, the oak processionary moth in the UK, written by Patrick Cook. Over the last 10 years, we've produced over 20 scientific papers on moths, ranging from the possible causes of the declines of moths in Great Britain, to trends and indicators for quantifying moth abundance and occupancy in Scotland, with Emily Dennis, a BC member of staff, as a lead author. And let's not forget the 25 million moth records from BC's National Moth Recording Scheme and Moths Island, which produced the landmark publication, The Atlas of Britain and Ireland's Larger Moths, I mentioned just before. From this, we've been able to look again at our moth priorities, and it's been closely followed by the exciting new analysis in the State of Britain's Larger Moths report that Rich is going to be talking about this morning. So from science to influence, BC is using evidence to drive effective action for nature and people. We're taking action to conserve and recover moths and butterflies. Sorry, I had to say the butterfly word, sorry. And we're engaging and inspiring people to fight the nature crisis. Absolutely none of this work would be possible without you in this virtual room today, so thank you. Some of you may have heard last year about our new exciting project, Kent's Magnificent Moths. This project was delayed as a direct consequence of COVID, but I'm delighted to be able to share this morning with you that this project's now planned to start again in April. This will be our largest moth conservation project, focused in an area which has the greatest concentration of rare and threatened moth species in the UK. The project's going to raise awareness with a diverse audience and it's going to help conserve moths in partnership with local groups. And moth conservation remains a major focus of our project work around the UK. Current examples include the Barbary Carpet as part of the Back from the Brink project and the new Species on the Edge project in Scotland, which has a focus on the day flying burnet moths. Our work to increase the profile of moths has been going well. 
some of you will know the hashtag Moth Matter campaign, which started in 2019. And to date, it has had almost 14 million impressions, meaning that 14 million people have had the potential to see those posts. And the top one was the Hawk Moth ID sheet, which reached over 100,000 people on Facebook alone. And it is still one of the most popular downloadable charts ever. Hashtag Moths Matters has been used on Twitter more than 60,000 times since its launch, an average of 80 tweets per day. Our last membership survey showed that there's an increasing interest in moths amongst our new members, and over 5,000 recorders now submit their moth records each year. We are definitely changing perceptions about our wonderful moths. Nature is for everyone, and everyone has a part to play in helping tackle the biodiversity and climate crisis. There is no doubt in my mind that the profile of moths, just how important they are in the ecosystem and how beautiful they are, is on the increase. And it is, in hel it is helping encourage more people to play a part in their conservation now, and I think for many years to come. But now back to today. So we've got a wonderful range of speakers. We have our very own Zoe Randall, Katie Crookshank and Richard Fox, and two external speakers, Luke Phillips and Professor David Wagner. And I'm deeply grateful to them for being here to talk to us this morning, especially David, who is getting up extremely early in America to be here with us today. And finally, I want to leave you by saying a huge thank you again for, for everything that you do as recorders to ensure that we as an organisation have reliable and valuable data to allow us to continue to make a difference and take action for nature. Thank you. And it's with great pleasure that I hand you back over to Richard Fox for the rest of the day. Richard. Hi, thank you, uh, Julie. That was uh, great. Um, I'm just seeing in the chat, um, people on Twitter saying that they haven't received the link. So I don't know if uh, Zoe or Sarah or someone can um, can have a quick look at Twitter using the hashtag UKMRM and uh, see if they can help out uh, with that. Anyway, thanks very much, Julie. We'll totally forgive you using the B word um, so early in the morning. Uh, we all know that butterflies are just moths, really. Um, so we'll uh, we'll definitely uh, let get, uh, let you uh, get away with that one. Um, but yeah, some Thank fantastic you, <laughs> uh, some fantastic uh, future projects coming up, and obviously some uh, some sad things to reflect on from a, a very very challenging year last year. But um, on onwards and upwards. So I'll hand over now to uh, Zoe. Um, I'm sure many of you will know Zoe, certainly those of you who attend these meetings um, uh, in Birmingham each year will uh, will know Zoe well. Zoe organises these meetings, uh, puts together the programme and does all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, and also is complete linchpin of the uh, National Moth Recording Scheme uh, since the outset. So Zoe's going to give us an update on, uh, on the scheme, um, how things have been going over the last year or so, and uh, what we might have to look forward to uh, in the coming months. Zoe, are you there? You're the first person to, for, for whom I have to say, you're on mute, Zoe. Yes, it's not a modern day seance. I am here. So uh, I should be, I'm about to share my screen with you all. Uh, are you, you should be. Yeah, I can see that. Is, if you... is it coming? Come on. Yeah, oh. try that again. There we go. Yeah. Super duper. And she's off. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's such a shame that we can't see each other in person. I love seeing you all at this meeting. 
and uh, you know there's a real buzz in the air really good energy and everyone feeds off it and goes home at the end of the day feeling really inspired and uh, and up for the, the the coming mothing season so i'm just going to have to pick up on your virtual energy today and uh, it's great to see so many of you here new and you know new new people to to the moth recorders meeting and plus the you know the the old hands as well so uh um, I'm going to give you an update on the National Moth Recording Scheme beyond the Moth Atlas. What I'm going to do as well is I've got a, all of you, I can see too many people. There we go. Super duper. So at the meeting this time last year, we were on a massive high celebrating the success of the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths. Um, if anyone hasn't got themselves a copy yet, um, I don't know if you can see me holding mine up, but here it is. It's absolutely lovely. Please do get yourself a copy. The link at the bottom of this slide can tell you where to get it from. So this was a collaboration with Moths Ireland and the National Moth Recording Scheme. Um, 25.6 million macro moth records were in the Atlas. It covers seven, uh, 275 years of recording effort and features 893 species. And it was quite an endurance to, uh, to get the book out and published, um, but we made it. And uh, we had absolutely huge plans for 2020. Um, we were gonna set off down the Yellow Brick Road on the Moth Atlas Road, Roadshow Tour. And, uh, and also go around the country delivering, at, yeah, delivering Atlas talks, promoting the Moth Atlas, and also um, doing iRecord training events. However, this happened and we were stuck in our tracks and we hit a brick wall. And we've all had quite a year of it, to be honest. Um, events were canceled, staff have been furloughed. There's been organizational restructures. We've had parents having to homeschool their children. Um, we've had, a, we're working, working from home. You've got other assistants that now uh, are either not as helpful as they could be, not as helpful as your normal colleagues, or in some respects, maybe they're more helpful. And let's not forget the challenges of uh, trying to get toilet rolls and, and pasta early on in the spring now and that's obviously not to detract from the you know the, the the horrific effects that this this virus can can have on all of us so um so we've been you know we, we've been really up against it and uh, we've all been through so much and it's no wonder that many of us are probably feeling like this little chap um pushing dung uphill but it's not all been bad news um the lockdown in the spring provided us with you know, really great opportunities. Every cloud has a silver lining. There was a 200% increase in butterfly moth inquiries to butterfly conservation in spring 2020. Moth traps were out of stock at most retailers. I was really lucky that um, NHBS donated this trap to butterfly conservation um, for me to use. And I've been doing some recording of, uh, recording of opening in the moth trap and everything. And I shall get back to doing some more of that this year. It's a super little trap, actually. It's very compact, lightweight, and it's got a black light. So you, uh, your neighbors don't think a UFO has landed in your back garden. And there's also been reports from many areas regarding increased moth recording. For example, in Devon, um, I've got some figures here. These are relatively comparable figures. So in the number of records that were received for Devon's annual report in 2019 were almost 80,000. Um, at the same time period um, in 2020, so the number of records submitted for the 2020 annual report was almost 130,000. So that's a 62% increase on the number of moth records that Devon Moth Group have received. And also there's been a 72% increase in recorders as well. So in 2019, 286 recorders submitted records for the uh, annual report. And in 2020, 491 submitted their records. So this is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, it's super news for moths and moth recording and obviously highlights the, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, highlights the extra work that county moth recorders are having to do with all these extra records and all these extra recorders. And let's hope that these people continue to record moths and enjoy moths in future years. 
So the spring lockdown gave many of us the opportunity to slow down our pace of life and gave us some time and space to take notice of our surroundings and the creatures that we share it with. Solace was sought in nature and more people than ever have realized the restorative and rejuvenating power that nature has. And nature is having a renaissance. Let's build the momentum and keep it going. So it's about time I showed you a photograph of a moth. Here we are, a Jersey tiger moth. And uh, Jersey tigers had a superb year last year. They are spreading out and they've spread, I don't know how far north they've spread, but they're spreading northwards across the country and expanding their range. So uh, I'd be interested to know how far, the, how far north the furthest record was for 2020. So if anyone's got any answers to that, then uh, pop them in the chat, that would be super. Many of you will be aware that the Moth Atlas work delayed or put a pause on uh, data import into the National Moth Recording Scheme. And uh, Les, Hill, um, re, uh, Les Hill reinvigorated the uh, data set import in the summer after his furlough period this year. And he's been busy beavering away, sucking in the data to the National Moth Recording Scheme. We've now got 27.1 moth records that are verified in the National Moth Recording Scheme, and 2 million have been added since the Atlas. We're currently collating data for a three year period, 2017, 18, and 19. So Les really has got his work cut out. Um, the map on the right here shows the um, this different status of the different data sets. So the green ones are imported. So 36% of data sets have been imported. We've got outstanding queries for 19% of data sets. 14% um, of data sets have been received and are being processed. And we've got 30% of data sets not yet uh, received. So I will be on the, on the phone chasing these data sets up. In, uh, in due course. And what I will say is the map was correct as of the 26th of January, which was Tuesday, and we received the Cumbria data, um, yeah, Cumbria and Westmoreland data yesterday. So thank you very much. So thanks to all county recorders that got their data in. Thank you to those of you who are getting it in. And, uh, and thank you, of course, to all the recorders that submit their data to the National Moth Recording Scheme. So moving on to micros, this is a really funky disco micro and I'm going to attempt to pronounce its Latin name, which is Erycrania sparmanella, absolutely lovely little creature. So as you know, micro moth, uh, micro moth, the inclusion of micro moth data in the National Moth Recording Scheme is in its relative infancy. We only started to collate records for micros in April 2016. So you can see here we've got much more patchy coverage and uh, we've got almost 3 million verified micro moths in the National Moth Recording Scheme. Um, and so far we've only imported 9% uh, of, of the, uh, the data sets. I know almost 50% haven't yet been received, but we're well aware that the verification of micro moths is a lot more complex than macro moths. And, uh, and as the schemes, as it's still in its infancy, a lot of county recorders are still getting their data organized and making sure they send us nice, nice clean data sets. On the subject of nice clean data sets, um, we introduced, we've introduced quality assurance on um, submissions, data submissions to the National Moth Recording Scheme. The county recorders do an absolutely fantastic job of uh, verifying their, their, their local data sets. And the cherry on the top is that Les is just following, you know, doing a few extra checks because it's when you're dealing with massive amounts of records, it's obvious, you know, it's inevitable that a few errors will slip through. So the cherry on the top is Les does this. It does create extra work, but it does provide um, much cleaner data for us to use. So Les uses the MBN record cleaner, First of all, he checks that uh, that records are actually in the in the relevant vice county, and then he uses the distribution rules, which pick up species outside of their known ten kilometer distribution, and also it picks up um, records outside the known adult flight period. So uh, that's in, in, important to recognise it's adults only in MBM Record Cleaner. At the moment, there isn't um, a function for checking um, larval larval stages. <clears throat> 
So having had a quick chat with Les about the error rate, he said there's only a couple of hundred queries for larger data sets of 10 to tens of thousands of records. So again, very low error rates. And as I've said, it's inevitable considering the size of some of these local data sets. So Les is currently fine tuning the MBN record cleaner rules as well, based on, on, on the data that's coming in and, uh, and the Atlas data. It's a fantastic tool, which, um, which is really useful and there's imminent improvements coming. It's also available to everyone, although you might, work, might be worth waiting for the rules to be updated before you download, um, download it. And we'll announce when the, when the rules will be released in due course. And also we're planning some training in MBN Record Cleaner as well. Ah, oh, a lovely satellite moth. So, at the heart of the National Moth Recording Scheme are the county moth recorders. And this network is vital to the National Moth Recording Scheme. County recorders form the backbone of the National Moth Recording Scheme. And it's really important to remember that they're volunteers, they're local experts who encourage recording, they promote moths, they provide feedback to recorders, they collate record, the local data set, they verify the records, they submit their records to the National Moth Recording Scheme. And often many of them do loads more as well. Um, if you don't know who your county moth recorder is, then check out the link at the bottom of this slide and you can find out. And basically, <clears throat> as Richard said, I'm the linchpin for the National Moth Recording Scheme for my sins. The county recorders are the linchpin for the National Moth Recording Scheme too. And, uh, and without the county moth recorders, the wheel will fall off. So it's really important for us to know how our county moth recorders are feeling. You know, are they all like united and happy in their work as, as county moth recorders or are they feeling a bit swamped and ready to admit defeat? Well, we worked in partnership with um, Wild Crew, the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit from um, Oxford University, and we designed and circulated a county moth recorder to sort of get, a, you know, get a feel of the mood and uh, see how, how, how county moth recorders were faring. 73% um, of county moth recorders responded and here are some preliminary results. So you can see here that there's only 12% of county moth recorders that are female, 87% are male. Um, it's not very many younger county recorders, only two in the 25 to 40 age group, but I would imagine that these people are probably busy with families and, and, and such like. So, uh, you know, they probably don't have the time that's needed um, to invest in being a county moth recorder. Um, and then we've got um, the vast majority, 60% are um, age 61 or over. We also looked at how long uh, county recorders had been in post, and you can see that the majority, 30% uh, have been in post for more than 15 years. Um, and then with the next sort of highest category is six to 10 years. So a lot of people have been doing the job for a long time and they've got loads of expertise. 51% um, of county recorders are actually retired and they've got 27% of, ca of county recorders are full-time employed. Again, you know, it goes to show that, you know, time, time to do the job is, is probably quite a big factor. One of the really important questions to ask was how has their workload changed? And 77% of county recorders have said that their workloads increased um, over, in, in the time that they've been doing the job. So then we thought, well, why is this happening? What's the reasons for this? Uh, oh, no change, 15% no change. So why are you know, county moth recorders feeling overworked? Well, the main reason is due to the more, you know, higher numbers of records being submitted. Um, also email correspondence, oh, uh, adoption of iRecord, um, obviously in the top three, um, wouldn't surprise a lot of county recorders, might surprise others. And da local data management and social media is also in, you know, increasing the workload. We know from the Moth Atlas that recording is increasing and who knows how it's going to be this year, what number of records are county recorders going to get this year. So it's absolutely vital that we provide support to county recorders because they really need it. The job has really changed. We need to help make the job more manageable 
and we need to succession plan as well for the longer term sustainability of this really vital network. So what we've done so far, obviously progress has been much slower than we'd anticipated due to the COVID situation, but we've run some iRecord verification training um, via Zoom and 68% of people that have attended these webinars have signed up as iRecord verifiers. And in fact, some of them aren't even county recorders, they are, they are people that the county recorder trusts and um, that they've got enough uh, information, enough knowledge and experience to actually go into iRecord and verify the records on their behalf. So it's great. So we're seeing more and more team working, which bearing in mind the number of records coming in is, is, is vital. We've also established a Yammer forum for county recorders um, to, to provide peer to peer support with each other because some of county recorders have been in post a very long time and they've obviously got lots of skills and expertise and technological know-how so they can share this and we're also looking at investigating local data management solutions so and uh, and we've got more more things in 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 the pipeline for that because ultimately, this is how we want our county moth recorders to feel happy and joyous. And there they are all up on a nice, bright, sunny day, looking forward to doing their role as a county moth recorder, as opposed to dreading it and being swamped. So before I run out of time, I'm just going to let you know that um, we are Butterfly Conservation is involved in a big project called Decide, which is essentially square bashing for the 21st century. Um, the aim, and it's a partnership project, we're working with social scientists, um, uh, uh, researchers, software developers, and, uh, and it's with the, the Centre of Ecology, in, uh, UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology in Oxford. And basically the aims of DECIDE are to do more targeted recording of moths and butterflies and grasshoppers in under-recorded areas using a technique called adaptive sampling. And basically this will nudge recorders to new places to get records in places where we need them most and where data users need them most. Um, the project will enable the development of species distribution models and will also provide accessible, high quality, fine scale information for data users for decision making at all levels to protect nature. So to put decide in context, um, more and more often um, we are being asked to produce data products for people rather than provide raw data. Um, for example, um, DEFRA approached us, uh, they wanted oak processionary moth risk mapping tool developed to inform um, aerial spraying to control oak processionary moth and look at the, you know, the non-target species that could be potentially affected by this. And we used raw buffered data to produce these um, risk maps. Um, and they're actually, this one's actually going, it's going live for this coming season. Um, we were also approached by Forestry Commission Scotland um, to look at um, plant tree planting opportunities. So Forestry Commission Scotland have got loads of trees to plant, but obviously they don't want to plant them where they're going to have a negative impact on Lepidoptera. So we worked with them on that as well. What we realised, though, is that species distribution models would be much more robust for these tools. Um, and despite the fantastic coverage we've got in the National Moth Recording Scheme at 10 kilometre square resolution, we are lacking fine scale granular, um, granular data. Um, there's, it's still a little bit patchy. So the DECIDE project can help remedy this. And, you know, as I said, recorders will be nudged into new places to record. So a little bit like if you buy a book on eBay or, or something on eBay or Amazon or somewhere like that, because you've bought this book, you'll be recommended other books, you know, because you bought this, you might like this. So, so Bob, because you like record, you seem to like recording in woodlands. Why don't you go to this woodland? We need some records here. So we really think, you know, it can be really beneficial. So, <clears throat> as I said, so targeted recording in under recorded areas means we get more records in the places we need the most. Um, we can develop up to date, optimised species distribution models to make better decisions and land management at a landscape scale. And the potential is absolutely massive. The models could be used to in the establishment of nature, nature recovery networks and other initiatives. And as I said, there's a massive shift towards data users requiring data products rather than raw data. And the Geospatial Commission has launched a cabinet office review of biological recording in response to the greater need for biological data and more streamlined, 
line data flows. I've got 60, 12 seconds left. I'm going to rattle through these. So the increase, there's an increased interest. So to summarize my talk, there's an increased interest in moths and nature in general. Your records are vital. They provide our, oh, that's my timer. <laughs> They provide evidence, uh, an evidence base to inform our conservation work and, and as you'll hear from Richard later, you know, reports like the State of Britain's Larger Moths Report. Recordings on the rise, the county moth recorders need support, we're here, we're here, we're going to help you as much as we possibly can. There's an increased interest in the moth data which raises a profile of all of your efforts, our data sets and our science and conservation work. Moths are a huge, um, they've got a huge role to play as indicators in biodiversity, natural capital and ecosystem services. And we need to celebrate the moth data and we've got to make it harder without making the county moth recorders work harder. And basically nature is having a renaissance and we need to be ready. So just a quick thank you. Thank you to county recorders, moth recording community, partners, conservationists, researchers, funders, supporters, photographers, and thank you all for listening. And in my usual style, I don't think we've got time for questions, but thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Zoe. Um, no, we don't have time for questions, I'm afraid. We're running over and uh, um, that's probably my Fault for rambling on a bit at the beginning but thank you for keeping to your keeping to your timer lovely to hear your alarm going off there <laughs> uh, but that was great i did see um in response to your question in the uh, in your talk about jersey tiger so there was a post from mark hammond saying jersey tiger has reached northamptonshire now so um i'm not saying that's the furthest north that it's got but that's certainly a lot further north than south devon which is the uh, <laughs> traditional heartland of uh, of uh, jersey tiger so uh, great okay i'm gonna move us along um and uh move over, uh, pass over to uh katie crookshanks who uh is going to talk to us a bit more, uh, we're going to, probably going to elaborate, I guess, a bit on some of the themes that Zoe introduced about how we can make uh, the data flow more smoothly, um, how we can reduce the amount of, uh, of effort required for everyone, um, and how we can make the, work, the data work harder for conservation. Katie. Thank you, Richard. Can you hear me? Yes. Can. So there's been a lot of um, chat about Richard's shirt. So I've decided I'm sporting the tangerine shouldered ermine look today. I just made <laughs> that one up for you. Um, right. Sharing the screen, hopefully. Yeah, looks good. Okay. okay over to you, Katie. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Katie Crookshank, Senior Data Ecologist at Butterfly Conservation, and my role at BC has been to review the way that we capture, manage and disseminate our data. And Zoe's just given a brilliant introduction and, and uh, summary of everything we do. Um, this work, the review stage, is now complete, um, although one thing I've learned is that the digital world is much like the fourth rail bridge and change never stops. Um, so here we are ready to make changes, but with any major review, change has already started and I want to give you a bit of an update. So why is recording important? I think we all know this, but we all love moths. And if we're in the auditorium, I might have expected one of my colleagues to say, I don't, in a rather Life of Brian kind of way. Anyway, we all love moths, young and more expert. And I love this photo of my daughter with Phil Sterling at the BC headquarters in Dorset. So loving moths is good for us. It's educational, fun. It's good for our mental well-being, which is a critical issue at the moment. It forges a community, which you're all part of, and provides a great distraction. And Zoe has shown the growth in interest in moth recording over the last um, year. So moth data are critical for understanding the local picture for moths, but they're also critical for BC. And without your data, we can't do our work as Julie um, expressed. But what does our work look like? Well, 
Zoe's talked about the Moth Atlas. We have lots of publications that we produce summarising the national picture of moths and Richard will be talking about the state of Britain's larger moths. But we're also out on the ground and this is actually a butterfly um, advice visit with Caroline Borman. But one of the more curious site visits I was party to was Mark Parsons in St James's Park looking for leaf mines in the middle of an Extinction Rebellion camp. Um, I think you'll all remember when London was filled with people, but I had to snap that. Um, we also use our work to influence policy and we're doing quite a bit of work on tree planting at the moment helping the agencies make decisions, as Zoe said, working with Scottish Forestry, to push home this right tree, right place message. And uh, as has been mentioned before, the oak processionary moth is another way in which the data from the NMRS is used to influence policy and to change land management. And then importantly, our engagement work. <laughs> but nowadays, our work looks a bit more like this. So where does all this recording happen? Well, it starts with an interest among people um, and obviously that interest has grown and, and the community, the public, the recording community want to do something with that interest. And there's gonna be a lot of references to butterflies here, so just watch out. So one of our major ways to gather or harness people's enthusiasm and curiosity is the big butterfly count. And, and going down this chain, it goes down in, in levels of difficulty of taking part and also the numbers of people who get involved. And then there's our major data capture routes such as our I Record Butterflies app, NMRS Online, our Butterflies for the New Millennium Online and surveys like Migrant Watch, Garden Butterfly Survey, the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey, our Transec work, and then our transect coordinators work. We're all filtering down to this point here, our county recorders, as Zoe has outlined. So how does the data get? So the data goes through these surveys to our county recorders. I'm going to explain a bit more about that, but also it goes straight direct to our county recorders from the recording community. And then our team sits around the, this group of people supporting them. And this is where we deliver our work. So our scientific papers, government indicators and our policy work, State of Britain's larger moths, moth atlas. And these um, outputs come from a, major, a number of sources in this, this chain. And the, then there's our conservation advice, action and decisions, similarly pulling upon data from this chain. And then there's our engagement work which sits right across a number of our surveys. But how, oh, how does a record actually get to us? Well, this buff tip was delivered to me at 7.16 a.m. in bed. That, that did happen. And, and that, that's a record, not, not the ideal way to receive a record. But there are many ways for a record to make its way to the NMRS dataset, and every record has one thing in common. They all pass through the County Moth Recorder, and here's how. I promise this is the last time you will ever see this disgusting diagram, but I'm gonna talk through it um, yet again with reference to where the staff sit. So this is, as I perceived a couple of years ago, our data flow diagram. And here's Megan, she sits here, and coordinates our wider countryside butterfly survey. Ian Middlebrook coordinating the butterfly transects. Zoe looking after our county butterfly recorders and moth recorders in the middle there. Les managing the data. Then Richard, Nigel and Emily coordinating and delivering outputs, papers. And then there's Patrick Cook who aims to help get data back to staff and branches through QGIS. The general flow of data is, is in this direction. And if I take that previous diagram of where our data comes from, it sits like this. Bit awkward, but there you go. Get rid of that. So that buff tip that was delivered to me by my daughter too early in the morning, I could put that in an Excel spreadsheet and that would make its way to a county moth recorder and on into the NMRS. I could put that into the 
the NMRS online. That will be extracted into a database, that pink bit in the middle now, and sent on to the County Moth Recorder manually, who will check it and it will get sent into the NMRS. This process takes quite a long time. And one of the reasons why is, is some of the, the handling of data that goes on. So if we take those that are in red and the NMRS online, these data sets are manually hoiked out of their database of origin by the recording team and sent to the county recorder. This is an ideal. Or the, the records in blue can be found in iRecord and the county recorder can so that should have been two stages, can either go direct to iRecord and, and get the data or we'll be sending it to them anyway. And then they have to unpick what they've collected from iRecord and what we've sent to them. So you can see it's a little bit messy. And we've had this vision of, of tidying up our data flows uh, by streamlining more of our surveys into iRecord, into the Indicia warehouse here, such that the county recorder can go and get the records when they want them. There will always be paper data and other imports that the county recorder will receive directly, but more on that later. We've got to minimise the number of these um, surveys that require us to move data manually to the county recorder. So we've been focusing quite a bit on tidying up this bit here. Um, and so just to summarise some of our successes over the last um, I suppose, a couple of years, we've got the data review recommendations in place. And as I say, these are done as they are in, in 2020, but things change rapidly. Um, and I can't guarantee that everything that has been written down and suggested will actually get done. Um, the NMRS online is currently in a, in a system that requires redevelopment and we've just been able to find the funding to redevelop this system into iRecord, which will close one of those manual data handling routes and pick up, um, enable people to receive feedback on their records. I saw Mandy and Glenn's comment about iRecord. I will come back to that in a minute. So the iRecord Butterflies app, which has been serving us so well since 2014, is now under redevelopment and will come online in the spring with a lot of positive improvements and a much nicer user experience and hopefully with some day flying moths. I think Jersey Tiger is a candidate. Um, the BNM Online, another butterfly data capture route, is now up and running in iRecord and some of the early issues that we had with that have been ironed out. And this is the this is the part where um, coming back to Mandy and Glenn's comment in the chat, we've been delivering these iRecord training sessions that Zoe has been talking about in order to get to enable counter recorders to get in to iRecord where the data are flowing into to verify the data such that the recorder receives a response. And so we're working on it. We've also been have run a fantastically successful QGIS training program for our branches and our county recorders. And this is to give um, the ability of county recorders to, once they've got their local data sets, to be able to do more um, in terms of mapping with their data. So this is providing support at the sort of green end of the data flow. What can you do with your data? How can you present it? Um, as Zoe said, we now run a quality assurance process on the NMRS data, which is proving to be very successful and hopefully will hold us in good stead for future um, Atlas um, publications and things like that. And we also host copies of both the NMRS and the Butterflies for the New Millennium in a database that staff can access directly using this QGIS um, spatial analysis software. Whereas previously, both of those data sets, butterflies and moths, were sort of hidden away and you had to ask the data manager for an export if you wanted to do any work. So if you were a conservation officer going out on the ground, you you were working towards having that freedom to be able to access data themselves. So on the horizon, we really want to get the data back on the MBN. This has been a long-standing plan, so watch this space. 
We want to speed up the compilation of our national data sets so that we can respond rapidly to the biodiversity, biodiversity and climate crises. We want to get our species data online in a really easy to use friendly format. We have a proposal in place to revamp the garden butterfly survey with some moths to create that to uh, create a community sort of hub that, that um, enhances people to understand more about their local patch, sort of in response to the times that we've just been through. People who take part in the big butterfly count have a real interest, but might not be ready to go to full on recording. So that's all very well and good. And we, we've very much so been focusing on this sort of streamlining and then a bit more on data access to staff. But there's this bit in the middle that Zoe has spoken about, this critical linchpin step that really needs more support. So just to recap what life might be like for a county recorder at the bottom of that train of, of data capture, um, surveys and, and uh, initiatives. So we send them data manually. They go to iRecord to get data. They get paper data, Excel spreadsheets, map mint, mate, <laughs> map mate sync files, online, other online data capture routes and social media. And they have to verify the lot and then send it on to us to incorporate into the NMRS and the BNM and provide for other, other um, outlets locally for reporting. And there's a number of tools that they make use of. And we really want to be able to offer something easier or at least let them know which ones do what. So some successes which Zoe has been through, so I'm going to whistle through. We're focusing more on support. The County Moth Recorder questionnaire has really shown us that. And we have a greater awareness of the issues faced by county recorders. We have created the Yammer Forum and delivered the training in iRecord, the training in QGIS. We have work underway to rewrite the county recorder guidance and to make it clear what, what, what's expected of them and what, what's not expected of them. And we're compiling a toolkit, as I said, all of those different kinds of systems and software um, to enable them to know which tool to use for which task. And we want to make it much easier to find your county recorder. So we've got plans in place to make finding your county recorder much easier through our website. On the horizon, we want to look at co-creating a local data management solution. So something that would sit around all of those different tools and enable county recorders to manage their local data more easily. We'll be talking about that in the County Moth Recorder meeting this afternoon. We want to continue training on anything that county recorders require. I think the process of doing the iRecord training has shown us that more regular online meetings just to discuss the issues is a really good um, thing to do. It lets us thrash out the, the way that data is changing um, and has been really positive just to talk actually. Um, we want to ensure that data repatriation is improved. We want a happy, galvanised, supported and supportive team of county recorders, like Zoe said, and equally our recorders to understand and feel connected to the purpose of their efforts. More moth love. There we go. So summary of our focus for 2021. Strengthen our linchpins, make recording easy and fun for all. Lead by example by speeding up our compilation of national data sets and continue to show ourselves as a, a data enabler, getting our data out there to protect Lepidoptera and our environment. And our final thoughts. Apparently change is hard at first, recognising that there are improvements to be made. It's messy in the middle, I think that's where we are, trying to forge forward, make changes and bring people along without millions of pounds to spend and with COVID on our back. Apparently it's gorgeous at the end. We will get there and be pa but be patient, keep recording, verifying and encouraging a love of moths. But as I've said num a number of times, change doesn't stop, especially in the digital world. And when one solution is implemented, another one becomes redundant. So just be aware, but stick with us, please. Thank you. I want to thank 
everyone who I've had incredibly insightful and challenging conversations with over the last few years. You're an amazing group of people and please keep up the good work. Thanks very much, Katie. That's uh, great. Love the, uh, love the fact that you're uh amazing flow diagrams have now gone into, well, not interactive, well, animated. <laughs> Just when we thought they couldn't get any better. <laughs> That's great stuff. I'm gonna move straight along though, because uh, we are still uh, a little bit over the, um, over the uh, planned timescale, but um, the uh, schedule for the meeting. So, uh, uh, well, I'm next, so uh, I can cut out on the introductions and um, get straight into sharing my screen. Okay, so um, something slightly different then from the uh, from the last two talks because uh, I'm going to be giving. Uh, an overview of uh, of results of analyses of the uh, of the data that uh, you and many many other uh, volunteers uh, produce and uh, verify and submit through uh, into um, into these recording schemes. Um, so we're we're working currently working hard on a new state of Britain's larger moths report. Um, I'm hopeful that it's going to be uh, published next month, at least in uh, in electronic form, um, and uh, that's uh, that's what I'm going to give you a quick run through of now. So um, there's been a lot made in um, recent years, and indeed uh, David Wagner may talk about this later on as well about catastrophic insect declines and the media have kind of created this label of insect Armageddon or even insectageddon uh, that you've probably heard uh, banded around. Um, however, most of the, the high profile studies that sort of started this, this ball rolling uh, have been severely criticized in the scientific community. And we really don't have enough data on how insects are faring, um, certainly not globally, and indeed not for most to the vast majority of insect groups in the vast majority of countries to really say how they're doing. But thanks to your efforts and the efforts of many, many other volunteers, not, not here this morning, um, British moths are an exception and they offer an opportunity to assess trends for a species rich and ecologically important group. The new State of Britain's Larger Moths report follows on from two previous reports that we've done in 2006 and 2013. And as with these previous reports, the uh, state of the new State of Moths report will analyse data from the Rothamsted Insect Survey. So this is abundance information um, on how numbers of, uh, of moths are changing. Uh, in the new report, we use 50 year trends. It's amazing data set uh, in terms of that length, breadth, length and breadth of, uh, of information. Uh, the previous report re uh, used 40 year trends. So we've added an extra 10 years in this new uh, report. And we, we look both at the overall abundance of larger moths, macro moths, so that's all species that are caught in the uh, in the Rothamsted traps all lumped together. Uh, but also we calculate um, long term population trends for 427 species, which is nearly 100 more than in the previous report. But also for the first time in a State of Britain's Moths report, we present distribution trends from the National Moth Recording Scheme. Um, and these are the same trends that are in the recent Moth Atlas. Uh, they're also long term back to 1970. Uh, and we have trends for 511 uh, individual species. And we can also combine those trends for individual species to produce uh, multi species indicators, uh, of which I'll show a, a few examples later on to uh, which tell us interesting things about how moths are changing. Uh, across the country. Just to point out and 
we should always bear in mind that although we can now produce these trends in both abundance and distribution for a large number of moth species, large moth species, uh, and indeed more than we've ever been able to produce before, these are still focused on the relatively common and widespread species. So for most of the rare and scarce moths in Britain, we don't have um, uh, these kind of trend, long-term trend information. Although we, we know a lot about where um, some of those rare species occur. So let's have a quick look at uh, some of the key results. If we look at total abundance first, so this is from the Rothamsted data, and this is all larger moths lumped together. So irrespective of what species they are, uh, just the total catch um, in the uh, Rothamsted light trap network uh, across the country each year. And we see that uh, there's been a significant decline uh, across the 50 year period of one third. So there are a third fewer moths flying around at night now than there were in the late 1960s. And as we've done in previous state of moths reports, we also split the data uh, into north and south and reanalyze the trends to see uh, what, uh, what they show for those two halves of Britain. Um, and as we found previously, the declines in moth abundance are greater in the southern half of Britain. But uh, importantly, in this report, we found for the first time in a, in a state of moths report that there's also been a significant decline in abundance of moths in the northern half of Britain as well. This plot uh, gives us an overall picture of the changing distribution of Britain's moths. So all of the separate trends for the 511 moth species, distribution trends for the 511 species, have all been combined into this single plot and this single trend line. And it shows, it's, it wiggles up and down as you can see, but overall, it shows a significant increase of 9%. So on average, the average moth of that 511 uh, moth species has increased by 9% in distribution over, uh, since 1970. And we can combine the uh, species in other interesting ways as well. So these are sort of habitat-based distribution indicators. So these are based on the habitats that the different moth species breed in. Um, and so uh, generalist moths that live in many different habitats will, their data will appear in several of these indicators. So for the woodland uh, indicator, so these are, this is for moths, uh, the distributions of moths that breed in woodland, not just the species that are associated with the trees themselves, but also moths that can breed in open sunny spaces, clearings and rides within woodland. And it shows a significant increase in distribution of 12%. Also a significant increase for moths that breed in open grassland habitats. But for moths that breed on moorland, and again, that includes both specialist species, moorland specialists, but also more uh, generalist moths, more widespread moths that, that breed in other habitats as well, uh, there's been a significant decrease in their distribution since 1970. And for heathland moths, there was no overall change. So let's move on to look at some, look at a few species uh, level results. Uh, again, starting with abundance. So this plot shows uh, the, the blue bars are species that are increasing uh, in abundance and the, whatever the color this is, pinky, purpley, reddy kind of color are uh, species that are decreasing in abundance. And for each column, the, dark, the darker color, the bolder color, are, represents those species that have statistically significant trends and the pale color, those, those trends that are not statistically significant. Anyway, um, when we uh, add all of that up, add up all the numbers behind uh, those, uh, those bars of different uh, colors and different shades, we find that 41% of species decreased significantly in abundance over the uh, 50 year period. 
and only 10% of species increased. And just under half of the species showed no statistically significant change. So four times as many moth species have decreased in abundance as have increased uh, over the last 50 years. But the distribution data, the data from the National Moth Recording Scheme, show something really quite different. Uh, here we find that 32% of species decreased significantly in their distribution, but 39% of species increased. So indeed more species have increased their distribution significantly than had declined. And again, just under 50% of species showed no overall change. Look at a few uh, specific examples. Uh, here's Flans chestnut. This is a, a moth associated with woodland and scrub, but it also breeds on uh, heathland and moorland. Um, and it's undergone severe declines in both abundance and distribution. You can see from the abundance plot down here that the species declines very rapidly up until the early sort of uh, part of this century, the early 2000s, after which there, there isn't very much uh, overall change. And in the in terms of its distribution, you can see that the losses since 1970 are really concentrated in the southeast and, and midlands parts of England. Here's another example, red carpet. This is a, a northern moth, mainly found on, on grassy hillsides at, uh, at quite high, uh, higher altitudes in most of its range. Um, and it's undergone a, a very steep and ongoing abundance decrease. And when you look at its uh, distribution change, uh, particularly since 1970, you can see that most of the losses have occurred in the southern half of this moth's range, possibly suggesting a negative response to climate change. So that's red carpet. If you, uh, if you add green in and, uh, and we look at red green carpet, as a completely different uh, situation. This moth is doing really, really well. Its abundance uh, rocketed really from sort of around 1980 to uh, again to around the year 2000, uh, underwent a really big increase. And it's been recorded much more widely uh, throughout its range really across Britain. Um, you probably remember from previous State of Moths reports and, and talks and things, that uh, many of the footman moths have been doing very well in Britain and uh, indeed they continue to do so. So here are just some updates for uh, orange footman and buff footman uh, showing the very rapid and extensive northward spread that these species are showing. This is probably at least in part due to improved air quality and uh, the increase in lichens because these the caterpillars of these species feed on uh, lichens, but I'd be very surprised if there isn't a, uh, uh, some kind of climate change response going on here as well. Indeed, when we look at the distributions of, uh, of larger moths that reach the northern edge of their European range within Britain, we find that the vast majority of them have shifted northwards. So in this, uh, in this analysis, um, looking at a 20 year period, we found that 71% of the species that sort of have the potential to move northwards had shifted significantly northwards uh, with an average change of around five kilometers per year northwards, which is pretty, uh, pretty impressive really. Um, and a, an extreme example uh, is the Devon carpet. This species was previously restricted to southwestern Britain but has spread north very rapidly to reach southern Scotland in recent years. Uh, its spread is about 16 kilometres northwards per year uh, on average, and its distribution has more than doubled. In addition to all of these analyses, the, the new State of Moths report uh, also focuses on positive stories of conservation success, highlighting the many different approaches taken to conserve threatened moth species in Britain. For example, um, landscape scale conservation for the Barbary carpet moth uh, as part of a Back from the Brink project. 
So there are only 12 colonies of Barbary carpet left in Britain, and many of them, many of them are vulnerable because of their small size, the small size of the, the populations, and because the colonies are isolated from each other. So this project has been creating new habitats to uh, increase the size of, of the uh, existing colonies, uh, which in itself makes them less vulnerable to extinction, but also importantly to provide lots and lots of stepping stones, lots of new patches of habitat through the landscape to link colonies up uh, and uh, secure them a, a better longer term future than they might otherwise have. Sometimes we have to go to uh, extreme lengths to protect threatened moth species. Um, some of you will be uh, familiar with this, quite a, a familiar story, told much better by uh, our colleague Tom Prescott uh, than by me, but um, I'll, I'll go through it briefly. So um, there's only one colony, one known colony of uh, New Forest Burnet left in, uh, in Britain, which is at a pretty isolated site on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, and the main threat to that colony is overgrazing by sheep. So fence, the fence is uh, really important to the long term survival of this colony because the fence keeps the sheep out. Um, but in 2014, there was a major landslip uh, on the site and that uh, damaged the uh, fence. There were some huge boulders coming down the hill uh, that took out sections of the fence. And obviously that allowed sheep access to the site, uh, potentially threatening the, uh, the moth colony. So Hardy, Hardy Band of Volunteers from, uh, from uh, Butterfly Conservation Scotland uh, hiked in, taking, having to carry all their tools and everything with them, carried out emergency repairs to the fence. And then fortunately the following year, we were able to get funding together to have a new second fence installed, uh, which involved having all of the fencing materials transported into the site by helicopter. So we will go to uh, some extreme lengths to protect uh, rare moth species. And finally, it's not often that um, insects, let alone moth populations, help to protect uh, important and beautiful sites from development. But this is Cool Lynx in Eastern Scotland, um, and it was threatened with development over recent years, development as a golf course. Um, and the presence and indeed the recording of um, a whole number of scarce and rare moth species at this site and indeed the appearance of uh, moth expert uh, Dr Mark Young as a witness, an expert witness at the public inquiry helped to save this site um, from development. Moths, the moth populations and the importance of the site for moths were specifically cited as the reason for refusing um, planning development for the uh, for the golf course. Uh, here's another moth expert um, hiding under his hat and glasses, but this is uh, Phil Sterling. Uh, I'm sure many of you know or know of, uh, not least through his uh, wonderful recent Caterpillar Field Guide. And, and for uh, many years now, Phil has been pioneering the um, the creation and management of species rich grassland on road verges. And for the last few years, Phil's been working for butterfly conservation and taking this message, all his skills and knowledge of these techniques out across the country, um, talking to planners and developers and councils um, about implementing these approaches. And um, he scored a, a significant success just before Christmas when Highways England, who are responsible for all the major roads uh, in the country, in, in England, uh, announced that they're going to adopt these approaches uh, for road verge management on all new major road schemes. So there's, uh, there's a lot of analysis in the report. Um, this is a sneak preview of the draft cover. Uh, it looks something like this. Um, this, uh, this proof came through to me uh, yesterday um, and uh, the report will include all these new analyses, but also um, hopefully showing a lot of positive work, much of it done by volunteers, um, much of it involving partner organisations, 
uh, the Nature Conservation Agencies and many other um, charities and landowners uh, to improve the state of our moths going forward. So just remains for me to, to reiterate the huge thanks that's already been expressed this morning to all of the county moth recorders and indeed everyone amongst you and out there uh, who submits records to the National Moth Recording Scheme or indeed helps with the Rothamsted Insect Survey, which is largely manned by volunteers as well. Uh, I'd like to thank all my co-authors uh, for the new report from uh, uh, Butterfly Conservation, Rothamsted Research and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and to these people whose uh, lovely images I've used in the talk this morning. And I hope that gives you a, uh, a quick um, uh, uh, and, and uh, early insight into uh, the contents of the new report. Okay, I'll stop sharing. So, um, how are we doing for time? We're out of time. Okay, so we have, uh, we have break time now. I will have a look at the questions that have come up um, and reply to those uh, in the, in the uh, Q and A, um, but it's time for a, a, a welcome break now. And um, we will start back uh, just after 11.30 um, with uh, the first of our two uh, external speakers. So I'm going to turn myself off now, uh, go and get a coffee or a tea or a, whatever you fancy, and uh, we'll see you in uh, 15 minutes or so. advantages of this very strange and, and uh, difficult situation that we've all been thrown into this year. But um, Zoom calls do, uh, or you know, similar online meetings do allow people to, uh, more people to attend, people to attend from, uh, from further afield um, and uh, you know, people who would, who would not normally be able to travel to, uh, to attend these kind of meetings in person. So I think, uh, you know, obviously that's a very interesting and, and important lesson for us all when life does return to some semblance of normality uh, going forward and we, we are able to, uh, to have real meetings, face-to-face -face meetings again, that we, we clearly need to allow for um, this kind of online participation at the same time to, uh, to broaden it out. So great to have so many people. It's still going up, actually. It's up to 313 now. There's a huge amount of stuff in the chat and loads of questions, um, which uh, I haven't yet got round to answering. I've answered a few of them um, and some of the ones in the chat as well. Um, but I'll try and uh, I'll try and answer some more of those as we go on. Anyway, as I was saying, the um, you know one of the uh, uh, what? Well, sorry, not as I was saying, as Zoe was saying earlier on, and Katie also reiterated, being able to go out, uh, even if it's only in your garden or a local patch of, uh, of green space or countryside during the various lockdowns that we've uh, endured in different parts of the UK over the last 12 months has been a, a real source of, uh, of joy and uh, for me personally, and um, being able to go mothing uh, in the garden and uh, a little bit further afield in Devon once the restrictions lifted um, was uh, really one of the things that got me through the last year. So um, on that note, uh, our next talk is, uh, is a pre-recorded one um, by Luke Phillips from Dorset Moth Group. 
uh, which I'm hoping one of my colleagues is going to run for us, um, and is all about uh, mothing in the lockdown. Who's going to play this video for me? Great. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, although this is a slight strange one, because actually for me, it's evening. Um, so we're, I'm pre-recording this. So um, it's going to be really strange for the next 20 minutes, because effectively, I might just be talking to myself, or that's how it feels. So, um, But uh, I know in reality, when this goes out, there'll be loads of you out there uh, watching and listening this, to this. Um, so yeah, so this is the, the, the mothing, the, the ultimate lockdown distraction. Um, and basically, I'm not sure why I was kind of asked to do this, really, uh, because it's a situation that I really hope uh, loads of you out there can kind of relate to. Uh, and, and basically, my, my whole aim is that, um, you know, it gives us a chance just to reflect on last year, which, you know, in reality, you know, if we look at the year as a, as a whole, um, it was one that we quite frankly want to forget. Um, so let's not dwell on that. But what was fantastic was how we all connected uh, much more with our fantastic hobby, uh, uh, and that's moths. Um, now, I realise time of day, it's uh, it's probably, you know, it's late morning, um, tummies might start to be rumbling. So I don't want to kind of just talk too long without showing you some fantastic images of moths. Um, so I'm going to focus in on, on actual lockdown and how we kind of got a little bit obsessed. Um, and I'll just show you some of the nice species. But later on, I kind of want to go into how we actually then sort of spanned out and connected moths with a lot more people using the kind of technology that, uh, that is available. Uh, in fact, the same stuff that we're using today. Uh, we all got a bit zoomed out back then, but we really did utilize Zoom. Um, so back to mothing, the, the ultimate lockdown distraction. Um, so I just want to go just before lockdown, actually, because there was something that kind of was a bit of a precursor to, to lockdown for us. And it really did set the tone, actually, for, for the spring, um, because there was something something about it. There, there was so many moths out there. It was absolutely fantastic. It really was that a massive distraction, really helped us through. Um, but yeah, back to February, just a month before lockdown, um, things kicked off really well. We were catching loads of moths. As you can see here, we had you know lots of common quaker, small quaker, uh, Hebrew character, clouded drab, all the classic spring species. Um, but on the 23rd of February, which you know is very, very early to be catching any numbers of moths really um, suddenly a water carpet turned up and um, that was you know a real surprise it was very early um, we caught it just by dusking actually we caught it near the trap at dusk and um, you know we were thrilled with this this is probably the earliest ever Dorset record and one of the earliest ever recorded in Britain and that really did set the tone for us as we went into March and things turned a little bit uh, sort of gloomy and doomy as they say um so yeah march my middle of march we got locked down so our, basically our routine became um set trap in the evening go to bed get up in the morning uh, check the moths and then kind of for me luckily i could work i work for the rspv hence why i can't actually be here today because it's our big garden bird watch uh, this weekend uh, which no doubt you're all going to take part in uh, later on or you may have done already so thanks for that um, but, you know, that very much was our routine, um, getting up and uh, doing moths and then going to work for the day. Uh, and that just went on for months, uh, a few months. Um, so what did we catch? Um, we caught some great species, lots of common stuff, like I mentioned. Um, but first off, I want to show you Blossom Underwing, because that was a real highlight very, very early on. Blossom Underwing is a, is a spring species, very you know, quite a scarce spring species. Um, in Dorset, it's, it's pretty much rare, to be honest. Um, but this is a migrant one, we think, uh, sort of an immigrant that's come in. Uh, from sort of from Europe because uh, it was at the right the sort of conditions were right at the time um, but a great species to kick things off um, another one which is a classic migrant but may not have actually been um, in April we caught Derrick's Plusia um, real nice species uh, often associated with autumn migrant influxes but you know uh, a spring record like this in April a uh, little sign that they could well be breeding which is you know extremely exciting I think last year there was actually a uh, a record of a, of a pupa somewhere uh, near London uh, and I've seen kind of talk uh, of them you know breeding around in the southeast of so Essex and Kent um, so you know it could be a species we see more often in spring which uh, 
yeah, quite frankly, would be uh, would be fantastic to see. Um, we saw some nice, pretty species like you know gold spot. Um, that's a real uh, absolute crackers, cracking species to see. Uh, great prominent was a good one. Uh, we caught this. Uh, I think this was our only one that we caught uh, this spring. Um, so scarce species where we are. Um, it is more frequent elsewhere in Dorset. Um, I used to trap at RSPB uh, Arm, where I used to catch this in real good numbers. There's a lot of old woodland there. Um, but yeah, nice one for us. Um, what else did we get? Chocolate tip, one of my favourites. Uh, moth I don't get to see enough of, but luckily did see a lot of during lockdown. So a lot of chocolate tip. Uh, obviously, ob it's pretty obvious where it gets its name from. Uh, you think of its back end being dipped in chocolate, but also don't forget uh, it's uh, obviously had its face in chocolate too, because they have this little brown stripe uh, on the face. Absolute cracker. Um, and kittens, kittens, where there was good numbers of kitten. Um, sallow kitten was obviously by far the most numerous. Uh, this is a sallow kitten here. Uh, we also caught things, you know, puss moth was quite regular. Uh, we didn't catch poplar kitten, but something we did catch, which was probably our lockdown highlight, to be honest. Um, we were very, very pleased to see this and it's older kitten. Now this technically wasn't a surprise because our, uh, our garden backs onto a, um, a river valley so um, we're actually trapping in a, in a place called Whitchurch Canonicorum uh, which is uh, in West Dorset uh, not far from Charmouth and Lyme Regis um, so not far from the coast actually which goes back to those uh, you know the blossom underwing I mentioned earlier that was probably an immigrant uh, we don't we do quite well for, for immigrant species um, but um, but yeah so uh, uh, what were we on about? Poplar <laughs> started going off on a tangent there. Um, but yeah, Wichuch Canonicorum is uh, in the Char Valley, and there is a lot of older. And we did have a bit of a sneaky suspicion that we might catch older kitten, and of course we did. And just to prove that it's a resident species, we caught about three, I think, in one morning, and we caught them subsequent as well, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, now we don't neglect micros at Wichuch Canonicorum. In fact, we embrace micros. Um, something that uh, you know I regret not doing right from the very start when I started uh, mothing sort of 14 or so years ago um, I kind of neglected micros a little bit back then but you know very much regret that um, top advice for anyone starting out you know some of them they're not actually that tricky to identify uh, they're just a little bit small uh, but their names are quite tricky to pronounce uh, my that's not my strong point so uh, apologies for any uh, any mispronunciations coming up um, but just want to mention a few micros that we caught um, so this one is Anania stachydalis, um, which is similar to one that uh, you know species you all might be fami more familiar with anyway, um, Anania coronata or coronata. Um, so I told you I can't pronounce these names, um, but I realised that uh, this one was a little bit smaller, and um, we caught a few of these uh, over the course of a few nights. And this species is very rare in Dorset, only known from a handful of locations. Um, and an extra one now, thanks to our efforts uh, during lockdown, and uh, feeds on uh, woundwood, uh, hedge woundwood, I think. Um, next up, we've got Salifa aurofasciana, which is uh, it's actually a species we caught a little bit later on, so technically may have just been outside that lockdown period. Um, but a great little species that, um, you know, it's been very rare in Dorset. It was first recorded in 1869, um, but not very often since. Um, but in the last few years has been sort of discovered at a few locations. Um, and actually during lockdown, it was seen at, uh, at several new locations. So a great, ex you know, a great example of a species that's been re recorded more widely, thanks to people making more effort this year in, in moths. So that's uh, Salifa aurofasciana, and our best micro by far uh, was Anarsia inoxiella, um, which, uh, you know, sadly a little sort of grey, stripy micro. Um, but this was our nearest to being a county first. So this was a second for Dorset. Uh, annoyingly, the first was in 2019. Um, so uh, not far off from our record. Uh, but yeah, this was a second for Dorset. And I just have to feature this moth before I uh, move on to some of the things we saw during the day. Um, I saw this in a moth trap one morning. Uh, this was actually outside of lockdown later in the summer. Um, but you imagine going up to a moth trap and seeing this, um, you know, it nearly gave me a heart attack, to be frank. Uh, looked in and thought, what on earth is this? Clearly a mocker. Um, but but what what species? A um, little bit of uh, investigation work revealed that this is actually birch mocker, just an aberration of birch moth mocker. 
and uh, and and yeah, Birchmocker is rare enough in itself uh, for us at Whitchurch Canonic Orum. Uh, there's very very few records in West Dorset. Um, so where this came from, who knows? Could have even been on the continent. Um, but um, you know, to get one is great. But to get this aberration was absolutely extreme. We were very very pleased to get that. Now I mentioned that we did a lot of day searching and it's well worth it you know we really did get obsessed the weather turned really nice kind of late april uh, mid april and uh, we got outside as much as possible that routine of getting up in the morning checking the moth trap going to work became uh, go to work but then try and have a, an extended lunch break as long as possible to go and look for moths and we saw a lot of things um so things like uh, you know micropteryx calthella and um, classically hanging out in buttercups um, as you can see here, uh, we saw hundreds and hundreds of these, um, all within the confines of our, you know, sort of extended garden. Um, we were walking, you know, only a matter of a few hundred yards to see all these species. Um, just down the down the track a little bit further, um, there was a lot of cuckoo flower in a little uh, sort of corner of a meadow, uh, which meant that not only were there orange tips everywhere, but also Adela Arufa matrella. So this is one of the longhorns. Um, although one of the longhorns that doesn't have uh, as long a horn. So uh, we're all familiar with, uh, or you may well be familiar with Adela rumorella, which is this one with a very long antennae. Um, but uh, yeah, Adela rufumatrella, nearly always uh, sitting around flowers of cuckoo flower. So uh, part of a, a handy identific uh, identification tip there. Um, we did go for some longer walks, I say longer, you know, <laughs> a kilometre or two, uh, just to stretch the legs and uh, walking around the lanes around the village uh, got us a few amazing species. Um, so first up, um, you know, isn't actually that rare, um, it's probably just overlooked. Um, but this is uh, Coleophora lutaria, which is a day flying species uh, and always found uh, within um, flowers of, you know, greater stitchwort, uh, which is what this flower is. So a uh, real nice species there that we saw lots of. And I believe this one is really interesting because the, the larvae uh, moves within a seed, a dried seed of the stitchwort. And that's how it uh, transports itself to where it's going to pupate. So uh, we didn't get to see that annoyingly. I think that's just almost impossible to see, but one day. Um, we also got, um, again, apologies for pronouncing some of these names. Uh, this is Pamini uh, Rehediella, or just Hediella, I'm not sure, um, but a, a, a very under-recorded day-flying species, um, considered quite rare in Dorset, but possibly not. Uh, and similarly, this is Antispilla metalella, which um, was probably the best, one of the best micro species we caught during the day. Uh, really shiny if you get in the light right, but my photography doesn't really show off that very well. But a great species that we caught just in the lanes, wandering around the village. Um, and, uh, you know, dusk is another time to get out and look for micros. Um, not enough people do it, I don't think. Um, it's a great time to, to see what's around. Uh, and our best efforts got us this Telecrisis tripuncta, um, which again, considered rare in Dorset, um, but probably not, probably just under-recorded. Um, so, you know, that's some of the, the really exciting species that we managed to catch uh, kind of during lockdown. And uh, yeah, we really, really did get obsessed, <laughs> really did get obsessed. Um, but I mentioned earlier on that we connected people much sort of you know, but, uh, from further afield with moths as well. So we couldn't see each other face to face, but as we're doing here, you know, we're connecting on Zoom and it's something we all become very familiar with. Um, but through a bit of a chat with uh, Dr. Phil Sterling, because um, he's he's from my part of the world in Dorset, uh, know Phil very well, uh, we often have little catch-ups. And uh, we were chatting over Zoom and just sort of thought, well, I wonder if you could show people moths through Zoom. And um, we, we, we tried a few different methods with phones and cameras and things, and we found that it actually works a treat. And um, off the back of that, we developed this thing that uh, sort of became known um, sort of uh, to a lot of people, sort of affectionately known as Moth School. So uh, Friday mornings became Moth School mornings. And uh, we started a, a Zoom session where, um, you know, I was really lucky uh, in the, the numbers of moths that I was catching. Uh, so many good species that, you know, were really real show off species. Um, Phil wasn't in that position, but of course, Phil is extremely knowledgeable. Um, so uh, between us, we managed to kind of 
create a really engaging session. And after week one or two, um, more people joined the party. Uh, our participants were, were growing. Uh, we got sort of 60, 70, or even 80 people attending. Uh, people showing the live moths expanded as well, up to about four or five of us some mornings, um, showing off our, uh, our moth trap content. And uh, I remember really fondly seeing some great species like uh, Great Oak Beauty. Um, I remember one morning particularly, I was in Dorset showing off sort of things that we get in the south. Uh, and then we went off to Scotland where um, Tom Prescott uh, had been to um, RSPB uh, Inch Marshes, uh, sort of near the Cairngorms. And uh, he'd caught uh, several dark bordered beauty, uh, you know, moth that, you know, I, I, I probably wouldn't see, you know, unless I made considerable effort to go to a specific location and see one. Um, but, you know, about 60 or 70 of us got to enjoy, you know, live dark bordered beauties uh, via Zoom, thanks to Tom and, uh, and Phil's moth mornings on a Friday. So absolutely wonderful. So the other thing that was wonderful as well, but my, my job with the RSPB um, was very strange last year. Um, so I normally work on uh, promoting our reserves and our events to you know as many people as possible. Um, but you know reserves were closed and our events were non-existent. Um, so something we do every summer is the big wild sleep out. And uh, this year, we uh, last year we took it online. Um, as again, lots of things went online. And, uh, and Big Wild Sleepout was, uh, was extremely popular. We had kids and families, uh, hundreds and hundreds of kids and families camping out across the country in their gardens. Um, so this is normally something we do on our nature reserves. We invite people to come along, uh, spend a night sort of with nature, sort of amongst nature. And, uh, but yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. So they're all out in their gardens. And uh, the next morning um, I spent uh, just sort of half an hour, um, you know, using the most basic of technology, just a phone, uh, a tripod and, uh, you know, and a good internet signal. And we went live and did a, did a live moth trap for anybody who was watching. And, uh, and remarkably, by the end of that day, over 30,000 people had tuned in and uh, watched our sort of live moth trapping, um, which really was fantastic because um, you know, I kind of realized early on uh, watching Facebook and, you know, particularly the Dorset Moth Facebook page, um, you know, there was lots of people posting, which was great. Um, not only was it just nice to share, you know, what, what you've been catching, but also the, on the other hand, there were lots of people out there who didn't have access to traps, uh, couldn't get out in the countryside really and discover moths. So, you know, through uh, Phil's uh, Moth School mornings on Fridays, uh, through you know Facebook pages and through you know events online you know, like like the Big Wild Sleepout, we managed to kind of spread the word about moths. And you know I think really 2020, um, you know all that sort of terrible you know pandemic and everything else has been going on. You know we can cast that all all aside really, um, not to kind of ignore it. You know it happened. We need to acknowledge that. Um, but at the same time, you know. We really did connect with with our hobby in a big, big, big way. So having said that, is that actually translating into more records? Um, so a little bit early to tell, um, but, you know, the, the early signs are that, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we know that more people have genu generally got more interested in moths. Um, which is fantastic. Um, that is hopefully in the future going to, you know, encourage people to start re recording properly and submitting records. Um, early signs are that that may not be the case, but of people who are, you know, already into mothing and already submitting records, there's some, you know, real positive signs. So just going by the current situation in Dorset, um, we haven't had all the records in yet, of course, um, that kind of happens over the next uh, you know, a few weeks, hopefully by the end of the month, fingers crossed, um, everybody gets their records in. Um, I still need to get some of mine in, so I will get cracking on that. Um, but, you know, last year in the in the 2019 annual report uh, in Dorset, um, about 48,000 records uh, were included uh, within that annual report. Um, so far this year, and, you know, bear in mind that all the records aren't in yet, uh, just through Living Record, which is, uh, which is our kind of system we, we, we tend to favour in Dorset, uh, we've received over 72,000 records so far. 
um, you know, that's a massive increase. Um, so and that reflects, you know, mainly people probably trapping more. Um, so, you know, more people were definitely, um, you know, making more effort to trap during uh, during lockdown and and for the rest of the year, which is which is great. You know, that has led to loads more interesting records and it, it is building a much more detailed picture of distribution in Dorset. Um, so, you know, I, I'm on the Dorset verification panel. Um, so I get to sort of troll through all these records and see kind of what people are getting. And, uh, you know, it has genuinely been really exciting. So, you know, I don't think I'm alone um, in uh, being totally distracted by moths during lockdown. Um, you know, it really was the ultimate distraction. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed, you know, me wittering on for the last 20 minutes um, about my exploits kind of through lockdown and, and since um, has just kind of prompted some nice fond memories of uh, what you got up to last year so um i realize i best not carry on because uh, you know there's another talk before lunch so um we need to get cracking um but yeah but thanks for having me and uh, again apologies i'm not actually live uh, here sort of in person as it were um but really hope you have a, have a great day and uh, and and happy mothing great uh well that was uh that was lovely uh, to hear from Luke and um, I'm sure, well, many of the things he said really chimed with me and my experiences over the last uh, year of uh, uh, extraordinary year that it's been, but one uh, where I've seen, I've been lucky to see lots of moths, including quite a few species I've not seen before. Um, just by looking more, uh, not traveling far, but just looking more. So um, hope that uh, uh, gives you some inspiration um, spring is on the way down here in the south. There are moths in traps I'm seeing in the chat. People have been catching moths. Obviously it'll be a little while yet for those of you further north, but, um, but the moths will be coming. Now the other great uh, advantage of, uh, of doing this meeting virtually on Zoom, um, uh, as well as enabling more people to attend and, and people who couldn't normally travel to attend, is that we had the uh, the luxury of thinking far and wide in terms of uh, who we could possibly invite to speak at the meeting today. And given the um, focus that there's been in the media, I, I touched on it earlier in my talk, uh, both in the scientific literature and in the wider media um, about insect declines around the world uh, in recent years, the, uh, the, the most obvious person, the person that leapt straight to mind uh, was Professor David Wagner. Um, so I'm delighted that uh, Dave's here to speak to us this morning. Uh, David is uh, a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Connecticut on the east coast of, uh, of America, of the USA, uh, but is an entomologist really at heart and uh, has written many papers and indeed books, field guides to caterpillars of, uh, of the, the USA and so on. Anyway, uh, they want to hear from you, Dave, not from me. So I will uh, pass you over if you can share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Now, can you see me as uh, without sharing the screen? I, yeah, we can see it. We can see it at the moment, but uh, okay. we won't see a presentation until you share your screen. Right. Well, I thought I'd just introduce myself initially. Well, thanks for inviting me, everyone. Uh, this is pretty exciting for me in the sense that I don't think we could get 200 uh, or even 300 um, moth watchers, if I included the entire new world at a Zoom meeting or a presentation. So we're just getting to the point now on this side of the pond where uh, there's an audience and moth photography and, and moth recording is, is really nascent here. And it's, it's just, it's, really a treat to, to talk to, to all of you and be a part of your, your annual meeting. So I, uh, I want to thank Richard for inviting me, especially he's been a wonderful co-author. He's fantastically knowledgeable about the phenomenon of not only moth decline, but, but also insect decline. And uh, he, he started writing about this, oh, I, I would say, at least a couple decades ago. And he was one of the first people to, to sound the clarion call, as you'll see uh, over the course of my presentation. And 
He's just been uh, absolutely on top of the literature. I don't know anybody as well who is as well read. And, and so again, uh, he's been a, a treat to work with. Uh, about myself, I, uh, I'm an insect systematist, a, a lepidopterist at heart. So I started at the University of California, Berkeley. And initially it was micros, uh, especially ghost moths, but also leaf miners. But because I was in California, there was an awful lot of development and conservation issues going on at the same time. And even as a grad student, it was hard not to be pulled into those to do surveys for rare species. And some of the most stellar examples of triage where um, we decided that no one's going to get their way as to a, a development uh, would be happening around the Bay Area, around Berkeley. And, um, some fantastic situations were worked out where we would give part of a mountain uh, to the developers and to residential development and uh, they in turn would have to pay revenue or taxes uh, based on their presence on the mountain and it turned out very quickly that we had all kinds of dollars the conservation biologists did and the entomologists and botanists way more money than they'd ever had before and was able to buy they were in a situation that they could purchase more land uh, get all the vegetation managed, and uh, we saw immediate recoveries of a number of species that had been quite rare. And so I've been involved in conservation, I guess, for about 40 years now. And, and I guess this, you know, being, being focused on moth decline now is, is something that uh, I, it's end up, ended up on the, the center stage. And it's something that um, I, I guess I saw it coming. We started losing our large, large moths here quite a while ago. And so we're at this point uh, missing about half of our Saturnias. And so one of, the, one of the overarching signals in this moth decline thing is that large moths tend to, to disappear quickly. So what I'm gonna do today is talk a little bit about insect decline in the Anthropocene, but then uh, move quickly into moths and Richard's really the authority as to what's going on in Europe. So we're, I'm going to have some data and speak about the UK, but for the most part, he's really the foundation and anchor, if you need to know anything, of what's going on, not only in the United Kingdom, but anywhere, anywhere in the world, really, but uh, certainly the European authority. So what I'm going to do is focus most of my examples on a larger scale, talk about uh, insect and and moth decline in particular on a global scale, but particularly in my backyard here in the States. So let's see if this, this will go. Yeah, so this is one of the early papers that Richard was involved in, uh, Kelvin Conrad in, in 2006, and you must know about this, uh, was a, one of the first to, to sound the alarm that we might have an issue and that we had some pretty solid data and trends going on. And, and this was looking at moth decline across Britain. But the really important message for a lot of us that are trying to figure out why moths are declining are the panels on the right. And it looks like uh, moths are crashing or declining much, much faster in the south of England, uh, where most of the people are, where most of the anthropogenic activity is. And they were increasing, actually. And so there was an overall rate of about one to 2% per year. And I'm going to talk about that a lot in several of my slides. And one to 2% doesn't seem like very much. And it's hard to convey to, to people who don't love these animals how serious that is. But just imagine you had uh, a, somebody with a fair amount of money, let's say uh, three, three million pounds or something, bought a place on a wild river somewhere that was unimpeded and they had decline or erosion of their property at one to two percent a year and it doesn't sound like a lot but even after a decade that property has been carved up and might be missing 15 percent of its land and after just two or three decades that that house might be uh, in in the river and and so this I can't tell you how fast one one percent is it's hard to uh, give a sense of that the, the one that really attracted, or the, the paper that attracted the most attention, I think, from scientists early on, was a study by Durzo and his colleagues in 2014. 
And they, this is the first global meta-analysis. And they looked at uh, 16 different groups of insects on the planet, uh, planetary-wide, the really solid data sets. And uh, it looked like in most of the groups that they were, they were had data for, and really most of the data in this global analysis comes from people like you, uh, insect recorders, uh, community scientists, and, and what have you. And it turned out that um, overall, let's back this up, for, there was a 45% mean abundance decline for many of these monitored invertebrates, whether it was dragonflies and damselflies or butterflies and grasshoppers were really doing a hurt. And I think in general, you don't wanna be a grassland insect in this world. And so the grasshopper thing was sort of a head scratcher at first, but when you think about it, most of the arable lands of of the planet are already in agriculture with tremendous pressure on the remainder uh, to be turned into agriculture. So if you get reincarnated as an insect, I think a good idea would be not to choose to be a grassland insect. It's just uh, not a good club to belong to. And, and so here are these, these, these general rates that we could talk about in terms of de decline from global studies and uh, again, the top one is Durzo looking at this basically 45% decline in 40 years and, and uh, this early study by Conrad et al. Again, showing these, these basic rates and a recent large meta-analysis by Van Klink looking at about a 1% decline, at least of the terrestrial insects. And when we're talking about moths, we're, we're mostly talking about terrestrial insects, but not all, as you probably know. And then this paper came along, and maybe you all know about this as well, and this is the Krefeld study, and, and, but this was really serious. This is when we, we realized that many more people needed to start collecting data and take action, but this was the, the decline of flying insects in Krefeld. But this is a very populated area of Europe, and so we're going to have to re return to this issue of just the density of, of people living in an area as um, sort of a, a summation of the threats that these animals are facing. But here are 75% decline in 27 years. This is the paper that just came out on the 12th of January where Richard was uh, a co-author and contributed mightily to the paper and uh, came up with the title. And, and really that's the punchline from, from my talk. And, and, and that is that moth decline is considerably more complex and heterogeneous than we, we might have thought just based on these general studies looking at an overall average. And so I, I think that's really uh, the take home message in some ways is that uh, we can average across species or across places, but ultimately the real important information are the individual tax of the species and, and what's happening to those. And, and we'll get into some of that as, as we move through this. So we, pre we presented some new data. You know, I'm a caterpillar person. And so we, we got three caterpillar data sets, one from Arizona, one from Central America and Costa Rica, and one from Ecuador. And we didn't know what was gonna, uh, what the data were gonna say, we're gonna say but uh, I'll share it with you. And if we go to the deserts of Southeastern Arizona, it's fantastic mothing. Uh, I, you, you, you can't imagine it. Uh, There's so many moths on a good monsoonal night that in, in, if you're using a bright light like a mercury vapor, there are places and times when you can only go to the sheet for one to two seconds. You have to wear earplugs and uh, you, you would have to button up your shirt. And for the most part, after, after two to three or four seconds at the sheet, you would have to back away and, and, and get many of the insects off of you because it would include blister beetles and some things that you really don't want inside your clothing. But anyway, if we go to Arizona, we can look at um, basically uh, a lot of annual fluctuation. And so even after um, about 16 years of data here, we don't see a signal, a really strong statistical signal of moth decline. But I can tell you that I actually think it is occurring and that one of the hard challenges for all of us is seeing a 1% decline or a 2% decline when there's tremendous 
generation to generation fluctuation. You know, these are boom and bust species. And um, they, they, they get released from their natural enemies some years, and then the natural enemies extract a, a horrific toll in, in the next generation as they build up. So we had no decline here. Uh, at least that's what the, the data said. Uh, but I, I know that the West is drying out. And if we had run this out for 30 years, I think we would have easily seen uh, a 1% a or a 2% decline. Here's another data set now. Now we're going to Costa Rica. And this is a, a, a phenomenal rate of decline. This is, this is when you're talking about the tapestry of, of life just being torn apart and despoiled. And, and, and so this is really frightening. They're, these are all the taxa here, the, uh, the, the lazy campus of the tent caterpillars, uh, some of the leaf rollers and what have you as we move down here. And anything to the left side of this line is declining. So uh, here, uh, at least looking at uh, uh, abundance, there was considerable decline. And if you look at diversity, uh, the decline is, is, is really striking. And we'll actually come back to that in, in a spell. So now we'll go down to the cloud forest in Ecuador. So I, we're just, we've, we've dropped down to the east side of the Andes where we've gone over the Paramo and we've been looking for Andean condors from the cars we're driving over. And we're gonna drop down into the Amazon basin. And as you drop down to the Andes, you're gonna reach, uh, reach the most biodiverse communities on the planet, right on the, right on the equator here. And uh, you're talking about places where they're are more species, by the time we get down to say 400 meters or something like that, there are more trees in a 10 acre, a 10 hectare parcel than there would be in all of North America, just phenomenal amounts. One, one light trap here would have more than all of the British fauna. Um, but, but anyway, we're dropping down. And here, when we get, when we start uh, to come out of the cloud forest at, at 2000 meters or 6,000 feet, uh, what we're seeing is an actual increase in the number of moths that they're getting at their recording stations here at this biological station at Yaniyaku. Uh, and this is again being driven, it looks like, by micros, corroded metal, uh, metal mark moths, and uh, again, a couple of the, the leaf roller groups. So again, spatial heterogeneity. Uh, this is data uh, from the moth recorders, basically, this is you guys, this is your data uh, plotted and uh, looking at occupancy of, of Great Britain moths. And, and this is data that uh, Richard Fox supplied to us and has been published uh, already in 2019, uh, plotted here in a new way. But you can see everything that's blue here is, is sort of less common over the period or the number of years of study. Everything in green is a species that is more common but the darker green here would be where we have a statistically significant signal where we, we really do know we have a decline. And likewise, the, the dark blue species or the dark blue lots are losing, losing ground over the period of the study. And so again, a, a very mixed signal. There's, you know, nature always has winners and losers, right? And um, we, we need to find out who's gaining. And, and a lot of the gains here, I would guess from, from my side of the ocean is, is being driven by climate change that we're warming up. So, so many insects in the temperate zone are driven by abiotic factors, uh, especially the, the lows of winter. But, you know, organisms, moths, caterpillars, other insects, they're not driven by averages. You can't look at averages. It, it's actually the extremes that make all the rules and get their way. And, and as you have milder winters uh, moving further north, you're gonna have more greater occupancy of, of species into those regions. But anyway, it, you, it, you do, we do need the kind of data that you're collecting on a per species basis if we're gonna be making sound decisions about what we should be doing with our dollars and our time and you know, which of these species need, need our efforts the most. Let's move over to the, uh, this side of the ocean. You guys have the luxury of having more data on abundance and range and diversity than anywhere else on the planet. So if we wanna figure out what's going on across the tree of life, uh, I almost always look to the UK first to find out what the patterns are. And it doesn't matter if it's moths or mosses or birds. I wanna find out what's going on 
in the UK because you have so much occurrence data relative to the rest of the planet. I can't tell you how little we have in how little data in general uh, or the community, the scale of the community data that you are all able to collect on an annual basis. But this is one place in Ohio, uh, which is an exceptional state where we have quite a bit of community involvement where uh, mostly amateurs and weekend naturalists are getting out there. And this is just for 4th of July butterfly count. So we're only getting out for this data set, you know, just once or twice in certain cases per year. But uh, the data from, from Ohio are quite bad in the sense that um, it's really butterflies are declining even at 2%. So that's, that's twice this 1% rate that we've been talking about. So you're, you're talking about loss of 20% or up to 20% of the, the biomass. So um, when we average across species, I'm telling you not to do that because we, we want to know about the details. It's really important to know if these are pests that are increasing in the northern part of the UK or um, if those are a highly specialized species. That's an important thing to know. But averaging across all these species is important to know too because that's just the biomass in some ways. Abundance, occupancy, biomass, they're all related. And so th this is the kind of number you need to think about how the nestlings are gonna be doing. Uh, one to 2% loss in a year is 10 to 20% loss in a decade. And that's the amount of food that will be available for birds or for foxes or um, even bear. And so it becomes very important in terms of ecosystem services and nutrient cyclings and pollination services and what have you. So that's one study from Ohio and it was pretty bad, maybe worse than uh, what you're seeing uh, in certain parts of the country, uh, maybe not as bad as you're seeing in, in, in parts of the country. Uh, this, these are butterfly counts and this is old data and I can only hint about a paper you're gonna see with, by the, the end of February that was accepted in science yesterday. And we're starting to for, finally, finally in, in this side of, of uh, the ocean get really large data sets from community scientists. Professionals can't collect this data. There's not enough of us and there's not enough money. Uh, but we finally are getting this thing called iNaturalist that's really going, maybe you've all heard of it, but we're getting millions and millions of records now from iNaturalist. Uh, we have our 4th of July butterfly counts, which again are community data. And we had one data set here from the, the Central Valley of California collected by Art Shapiro. All three of these data sets, which are pretty substantial, tell the exact same story. Well, they're not the exact same story, but they tell an alarming story for um, the whole of Western North America. So, so um, this is somewhat proprietary and, and you're gonna hear about it, but it's work done by Matt Forrester. And um, I'll just say that uh, butterflies are declining in many different areas across Western North America. And the bad news here, and, and I hate to be the bearer of, of bad news, that many of your declines in England are easily explained by anthropogenic stressors. Or we, we kind of understand when we have 250 people living per square kilometer in a country that we're gonna have biodiversity problems. That's, we get it. Um, that's not what's going on in Western North America. Uh, some of these places where we're seeing declines don't have the anthropogenic footprint that you see in the UK. And um, we're gonna come back to that. Uh, this is the worst rate of decline that's been reported for Mars that I know about. And this is a, a, a Costa Rican Atlantic lowland rainforest um, in North, it would be Northeastern Costa Rica. And they, they had a, a 39% uh, decrease in Lepidopteran diversity. So that the, I showed you a decline earlier uh, that wasn't quite this steep for Costa Rican moths, but that was abundance. Uh, this is actually diversity or species diversity. And over a fairly short period of time, we're seeing a pretty catastrophic loss of, of moth species diversity. And this is probably the, maybe the, the low point of our time together. And, and so uh, this is Dan Jansen. He's arguably the most famous tropical biologist in the world and has won a, a, essentially the equivalent of the Nobel for biology. Um, he is a, 
a, an ecologist and not a moth recorder per se, uh, but he's very interested in tritrophic interactions uh, of plants and of caterpillars and their parasitoids and collects and rears tens of thousands of caterpillars every year. So has a tremendous data set. Uh, he has 10 full-time gusaneros, at least, maybe in some years, 20. And these gusanero, gusanero is a, um, gusano is a worm. So a gusanero is a worm collector or a worm hunter. And so he has this tremendous data set and it's not good uh, what, what, what he's seeing. So um, I think these sheets uh, tell you about all you need to know. The sheet on the left is what you might experience in southeastern Arizona on the, in the very best place on a ve in the very best monsoon. Uh, it's even crazier than that when you get into the um, when you get into the uh, the tropics and you get it especially into seasonal tropics. I'm probably running a little short on time, so I'm going to uh, pick up my pace here. But I am getting closer to the end. Um, so here is so this is these were three years up to. So this is 20, uh, 1984, uh, 2007, and uh, 2019, a typical night in the spring on a new moon. This is basically what he's seen since two, 2005. The caterpillar fauna in his area of Costa Rica has been crashing at an alarming rate. This is what he thinks is going on. This is uh, 1985, 1995, uh, 2015. These forests that used to be bathed in, in clouds and where these animals and these plants and these insects had very high humidities, perhaps never exposed to low humidities are now being exposed to drying conditions. You know, an insect, a moth has this tremendous physiological constraint. They are all surface area and hardly any volume. They do not take to drought well. Um, and that's also true of some of their other stages. Um, so this could actually be a very, very serious problem uh, for Lepidoptera or insects in general that perhaps hasn't been receiving enough attention. So some conclusions from my talk, uh, well-documented declines across Western Europe, you know that, uh, but many species are increasing. I'm not certain that you have an appreciation for that, but probably you do, um, especially with climate change that's expected. Um, the take home message, great heterogeneity, and, and we have to know what's going on for the species. The ones that are really tanking, so those blue dots in, in the British data, a lot of those are uh, ecologically specialized species, for example, a species that would be in, you know, from bogs perhaps, or a species that are, were in uh, grassland communities that were not very nutrient rich, um, other, other kinds of, of um, so, soil types, uh, dolomitic soils and what have you. Um, large species, as I mentioned, uh, and dietarily specialized species. So the generalists, there's always winners and losers. And I guess when there's, an extinction crisis, sometimes being a generalist, is a good way to get through it. Um, we, we don't know what's happening uh, in, in the tropics, but these early reports are very scary. And, and again, uh, there, many of these are far away from people, so it's a different stressor. These are the stressors. None of these will surprise you. Habitat loss, agricultural intensification, climate change, um, introduced species. You're starting to hear more about nitrification. Moths have, um, in addition to all the things that are tearing at the fabric of life and the tapestry of, of mother nature, uh, we, you can add to all of these pesticides. And we really think light pollution is playing a bigger role perhaps than previously considered. I know uh, Richard, one of the students has a review on this and I think the results were pretty striking. Uh, but also we have genetic engineering uh, just to, to rid ourselves of bugs. And if it's not uh, directly targeted at the bugs, it's a, it's a gene to impart resistance to herbicides. So now uh, these acres and seas of, of corn and soybean in the central United States can be sprayed uh, for herbicide and, and just eliminate all of, the, all of the weeds and nectar sources and, and plants growing in, in hedgerows and what have you. So it's, it's really taking a toll. Some other things that I think about that are sort of novel, um, I think droughts are more significant than uh, global warming or um, this, this increase in temperature. And so uh, almost everybody, at least on my side of the pond, equates global change with 
uh, it, or climate change with global warming. And I actually think it's things like droughts and climate variability that are more serious for insects than, than just the one to two degrees increase in, in temperatures. Uh, cloud bank diminishment, I think is gonna be very, very serious. Again, it's, it's basically getting at drought. Nitrification, we're nitrifying the entire planet uh, with the burning of fossil fuels. Um, I, I don't have time to explain how that happens, but um, all these communities that have uh, plants that uh, that have evolved over millions of years uh, to get by on no nitrogen budgets now are being fertilized and, and nitrogen is going to change everything into more uh, generalized vegetation and with that the loss of those specialist species of Lepidoptera. Anyway, um, I'm just going to skip past this because I think I'm out of time. Some key points. Uh, we haven't really talked about um, declines in abundance versus diversity versus biomass. But, but the declines of the common species are really important and that those are the ones providing the ecosystem services and those are the ones that the birds are connecting their fates to. They're the ones that are, that are part of the, the food web of life. Once you get to be a rare species, it, it, you know, we want to protect you, but uh, you're not really uh, an important part of the ecosystem. So it's the loss of the really common species or the decline of really common species that has the greatest ecological consequences for all of us. These rates we've talked about, so I'm, but I can tell you that a one to two percent decline, if you're not collecting kind of data that you guys are all collecting, is is impossible, impossible to see. So we really do need that data, and it certainly wouldn't stand up in a court of law um, if I were out there uh, waving my hands trying to claim that um, you know the sky is falling, and insects are going away, uh, because there would be other people that would claim that that uh, things are, are not so bad. So you, we have to have data for these kinds of declines. Um, I think that European declines often precede climate change and neo, neonicotinoid use so, and pesticide use. So some, some of these declines have started 200 years ago. So I think that's telling about uh, what those stressors are. And um, this last point, no obvious cause. And um, I think the reason for this is, is becoming clearer and clearer. Uh, it, it isn't one cause. That's why the best scientists in the world haven't been able to pinpoint it. We don't know why those 75% of the flying insects disappeared in Germany. Um, and it's because it's, it's almost always uh, death by a thousand cuts or two or three or four or five stressors in any one place with that number really going up where you have lots of people. And um, but climate change is it, that's very different. That can be happening in the tropics and in the wildlands of Canada, and has me very worried, particularly in terms of droughts and climate variability. Um, important things we need to know: what's happening in the wildlands, um, in areas of low occupancy. Uh, you guys have an awful lot of people per square kilometer. But we really need to know what's going on in Canada um, and in other places across the tropics. We don't have much data, just a little tiny bit of data from Costa Rica. We don't know if insects are declining faster than other, other groups on the tree of life. We know about the, that we're in a biodiversity crisis, uh, but are insects declining faster? And if so, why? And lastly, this would be uh, just some things you can do. You already know this, so I'm gonna move through it. Uh, pretty fast, but what you're doing is really important. And you, you could try um, rewilding areas in your community. Of course, you know this, um, I'm gonna skip down. Maybe maybe uh, become more of an ambassador, educator to other people so that uh, others uh, start to, to, to appreciate insects a little more. You certainly do more in uh, the, the old world than you do in the new world at this point. Uh, changing policy is the fastest way to bring about change. We can all do things in our yard and we should do things in our yard and we can educate the children. But right now we're, we're sort of at the, the front end of the, uh, the, you know, the sixth great extinction and we need to do all we can as fast as we can. And that, that comes with policy. And uh, you can check out the PNAS special issue. All those papers are for free, but there's one, eight things that you can do to, to, to help insect diversity. It's many of these things, and it's probably some of the things in your own uh, be the butterfly effect. Um, so I think I'll stop there and, and, and uh, let you guys get some lunch, but I could take a few questions. Thanks very much, David. Uh, I'll uh, 
we'll just imagine the huge round of applause that's going on uh, at the moment. I'm sure there'll be comments in the chat and uh, and all that, but it's uh, it's great uh, to get your expert view on all of these changes and particularly to hear some of the data uh, from um, from the Americas and, uh, and some of these places that have uh, uh, not been as intensively studied as, um, as our insect populations here in, in Northwest Europe. Um, there are a few questions. We've not got much time, but um, I will read out a few questions. Um, and I haven't got everyone's names because people's names don't necessarily come through on their, uh, on their um, Zoom handle or possibly only their first name. But um, so I won't, I won't read the names, but just the questions. Um, so one is relating to the declines you talked about in Costa Rica and the uh, suggested uh, mechanisms for that to do with, uh, with climatic changes and particularly drying and the, the shifting of these cloud banks. So the question is whether the meteorological records from places like Costa Rica support that theory. You know, is, is there good meteorological data that, that uh, backs it up? So uh, in terms of the clouds uh, that Jansen's identifying, that's well documented and it's also driving amphibian declines, obviously, uh, again, moisture. So um, that's, that's uh, absolutely uh, documented. And one other thing that another uh, really important take home message here from me is I've, I think that I, I mentioned it, but I just want to reemphasize it. It's climate variability as well. So what's happening in Costa Rica is the, the rainy season starting and stopping and it's coming at different points of the year and, and the storms are more intense, but, but it's actually that the, the things are coming at different times and some of these insects are getting signals to fly at, at two times of the year when they really should only be flying at one time of the year if they're gonna escape their natural enemies. But, but the drawing is real. Now, the data there in, it's a good question. The data in Costa Rica is not all that great. Um, it, it really isn't. But Jansen is by far, I, I think the best field biologist I've ever met in the tropics. And, and when he, he has, he's, he's National Academy, he's a, you know, again, since he won the Nobel, when he says something, you should listen at least. And, I think he usually gets it right, and and uh, because these are these declines are happening in really wild places on volcanoes, far away from people, you have to believe that this is this is driven by something unseen, and it's not agriculture, it's not pesticides, it's it's not light pollution, it's something different. That's great, thank you. And then I'm just going to combine a couple of questions because they're on sort of similar topics. Um, uh, so one is, uh, it's around um, what, how much of a role you think uh, modern agriculture, intensive agriculture has played in the, uh, the declines that you've seen of uh, moths and butterflies in the States, and also what kind of conservation measures are being implemented in the, in the US for, uh, for these grassland species, which as you, you rightly point out, seem to be uh, particularly struggling, as indeed they are in Europe as well. This agriculture and biodiversity is one of the, the most difficult questions you can ask about. There is absolutely no question that agriculture is driving a lot of biodiversity loss in the United States, uh, across um, across the tropics in particular. One one thing that I another take home message for you guys is. Uh, probably 80, at least 80% of all insects are in the tropics. Uh, we don't know yet uh, how many are there, but it actually, Jansen says it's going to be north of 80%. You, in the literature, you're only going to find that half of them are there, but it's actually more, uh, no doubt. Uh, but so with agriculture and the demands of, of food uh, from Europe and from North America, we are, we're causing the deforestation of the world right now. Um, our own, our own food uh, desires. And I can't tell you, there's also a lot of social inequity uh, involved. This is a really super hard problem. And um, we, we are taking a lot of measures and there is money now. Uh, we, we need to make na nature uh, more, more friendly. And, and there's lots of ways to do that by, by building corridors and uh, actually working with, with, with farmers and providing incentives. So we're, we're way behind you guys. But um, on the other hand, we, we are starting to see a sea change in, in attitudes. But, but the real battle is not in Europe. 
and, and it doesn't, I mean, it is for you if you love your species, but the real battle is the tropics. I mean, if, 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 if we truly, truly take a planetary view, we've got to spend some of our time thinking about uh, how, how to make things better there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a global biodiversity crisis. And whilst we understandably love and, and get preoccupied with rare species and declining species uh, on our own patches and indeed in, in the UK, it's, uh, there's a much bigger battle to fight. Uh, well, I'm going to draw things to a close. The, the chat is full of, um, of comments about uh, what a brilliant talk that was, Dave. Um, and also how alarming. You seem to have uh, both inspired and depressed people with, with pretty equal measure there. Well, I, I wanna, my, my last comment will be, we, we have to focus on solutions. Uh, that's, the only, that's the only way forward. And so the despair doesn't matter. That's not, that's not allowable in my mind. Um, we, we, you guys are doing what you need to be doing in terms of collecting data, and we can all do something uh, you could, you know, you could look at your own your own material. You could look at the PNS volume. There is an article there on agriculture and, and insect diversity, right? So you, you could see that, and it's a big problem. But anyway, we only can focus on solutions and doing better and, and doing the best we can to give Mother Nature a helping hand. So. That's great. Thank you very much. And um, thanks again for getting up early. You've got the rest of your day ahead of us, uh, ahead going of you. Back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going right to bed. <laughs> <laughs> very sensible. Uh, great. Nice to meet thank, you all. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Bye. Uh, okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to all our speakers from this morning. Um, I can see from the chat that um, people have found it a very interesting, uh, stimulating, and, uh, and also concerning uh, morning, um, and uh, but I'm delighted that we've been able to put this uh, this uh, event on for you in this format. It was a reduced number of talks, and obviously without the uh, the wonderful sort of face-to-face, uh, -face positive, uh, enthusiastic uh, day that it, it normally is in Birmingham. But I, I'd just like to thank again all of the speakers from today, particularly Zoe, who uh, has organised the meeting and uh, our unseen colleague, Sarah, who's uh, at uh, Butterfly Conservation Head Office, making sure that it all, uh, it all works from a, a technical perspective and, and keeping us all on track. So um, with that, we'll uh, say goodbye. Um, the, and uh, well, a few of you, County Moth Recorders, will be meeting up later on in a different, a different meeting to talk about uh, specific things. But, uh, but otherwise, yeah, enjoy the moths and um, see you again soon.